sentences or words. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the words of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So if someone is going to speak, and in the context there he's talking about speaking forth God's will, it needs to be the Word of God. It needs to be the oracles or the utterances of God. And we find the uh, Word of God in the sacred writings of the Scripture. And that takes us to the second Scripture, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, Paul tells Timothy that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Then he says, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16, All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the utterances or the oracles of God are found in the Bible. And these two passages here, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17, tells us everything that we need to be right in the sight of God for our conduct, for what we teach, is found in the Word of God. That's why we don't have a human creed. That's why we do not have a group of men to assemble together to vote and, uh, and to make decisions for us in Churches of Christ on whether we're going to teach this or do this or teach that or do that as you have in the churches of men. There's nothing to vote on. It's already been given. It's already been settled. We either believe and obey it or we don't. And so uh, God has given us everything from, uh, for our life, for our righteousness before God in the Scriptures. And that includes both Old and New Testament. We are under the New Testament today, but that includes Old and New Testament as being God's sacred volume to us. There's not another volume that is sacred or is inspired. This is God's Word, those 66 books. And there's many evidences within the pages of the Bible internally that show that this is from God, predictive prophecy, things that have been fulfilled uh, in history and in the life of Jesus Christ, and external evidences that the Bible is the Word of God. Uh, Things uh, like, uh, as you look into the Scriptures, the medical foreknowledge concerning certain things uh, that's found in the Word of God. Uh, The fact that the Bible speaks of life beginning at conception, as we studied a few Sundays ago. Science agrees with that today, but the Bible said that all along, that human life begins at conception. Therefore, that's just one of many, many things that we could look at that shows that this book is inspired. We don't blindly follow the Bible. We believe the Bible is the Word of God based on evidence. And it's an evidence that demands a verdict, and the verdict is this is God's book. This is God's Word. So therefore, why would we need a creed? Why would we need someone to write something, something for us to formulate uh, statements of doctrines for us to believe? We don't need that. And also concerning the concept of the headquarters of the church, we will uh, see that as we go into our chapter. Chapter 13, page 83, the... Uh, author says, fasten your seatbelts, for this is going to be a bumpy ride. We have hundreds of different denominational church organizations all around us today. These are the offspring of Roman Catholicism, the mother of denominations. Church historians agree that the early days of Christ's church, all Christians were one in Christ, Galatians 3 and verse 28. No such group existed as denominational Christians, wearing different denominational names, being of different faiths, controlled by man-made creeds. And that first paragraph is very powerful, saying all of these concepts of creeds 
within churches and these uh, formation of statements of faith all go back to Roman Catholicism. And Roman Catholicism is the mother of all denominations. And therefore, we see the problem with that uh, immediately. Uh, the second paragraph, a classic illustration of the reality of this problem was that what happened one day in Port Elizabeth, South Africa. As missionaries were, uh, we were told of a visitor who got off a British ship and asked the customs officer, could you tell us where to find the church? The officer looked puzzled and said, which church do you mean? We have many different churches here. The Catholic Church, the Baptist Church, the Dutch Reformed Church, the Methodist Church. Which one do you mean? And you could go anywhere in any town in the United States and see that problem. I mean, sometimes they're literally right next door to each other. Two different types of churches right next door to each other. Sometimes you can go to an intersection and on all four corners of the intersection you can have four different types of churches each one calling themselves something different, each one having different confessions of faith, but then they'll turn around and say, well, we're all one. You're not one if you literally build walls to separate you from one another. That is a pseudo-unity. That's not true unity. Page 48. This problem began in the early years of Christianity when leaders of congregations from different cities arranged meetings to help deal with problems uh, confrontations and opposition. Those attending these meetings would be representatives from each congregation of the Lord's church. Naturally, the leaders, the elders, pastors, all referring to the same group of men, of each church would send the most influential one to attend gatherings. The attendees would return with decisions made at the meetings, which in turn would be accepted by their congregations. This process resulted in churches following decisions made by bishops from other congregations. Ultimately, results grew into meetings covering large areas attended by representative bishops from those smaller conferences. A major development evolved from such meetings, the form of the Nicene Creed in the year 325 A.D., Emperor Constantine was a part of that. He was very friendly to uh, the Christians and Christianity. And by that time, the church had departed so far in its teaching and practice that they started formulating creeds. Now, the word creed, we'll get to this later on in the book, comes from the Latin word credo, which means to believe. To believe. Now, we have a creed as Christians. It's the Bible. We believe the Bible. We have no human creeds. And what we're talking about here is the formation of human creeds. In the, the Nicene Creed is the, uh, formulated about the year 325 A.D. You can go on the internet and you can find the Nicene Creed and uh, read it for yourself. The word creed comes from the Latin credo, translated to believe. Our dictionary definition of creed is a brief, authoritative formula of religious beliefs. It is an authoritative formula of religious beliefs. One time a gospel preacher said that he had received a letter from, I believe it was someone in Australia, that was curious about churches of Christ. And he asked if the preacher could send him the creed book of the churches of Christ. So the preacher mailed him a Bible. He said, this is our creed. This is what we believe. And that's exactly what he should have sent him. Even though there are good authors within the church and where we're reading from an author right now. However, this is not authoritative. We have to judge everything he says by this standard. And we're not impressing this upon anyone to believe anything that this says. This is not authoritative. No one can speak for churches of Christ as being the voice of the churches of Christ. You know, in, in the man-made church, churches, you can go into a book of denominations today and they'll give the official website of that particular denomination. 
uh, whether it be some sort of a Baptist website or some sort of Catholic website, they'll give the official website of that denomination. And you go there and you can find the person that's at the top, whether it's the general superintendent, whether it is the president, whether it is the archbishop, or whether it's the pope. All of those things go back to the concept of Catholicism, having someone at the top running the show. And that is contrary to biblical teaching. Any questions or comments before we go any further? Page 84, second paragraph. Today we have many differing creeds that control a given denomination. The Roman Catholic Catechism. The Anglican or the Church of England Creed Book. The Methodist Discipline. The Baptist Manual and many others. I did a, a search on the internet of the creeds of denominations, and it has all these different categories, and it gives their creeds, and you can click onto their creed and read their statements of faith and what they believe. And it has all these different denominations in their creeds, but churches of Christ were not listed because we don't have one. We don't have a creed that's written by men. We follow the Bible. And that alone. Another authoritative denominational governing system is seen in which one man or woman is the head of that church. Examples of such a list are the Pope, head of the Roman Catholic Church, the Archbishop of Canterbury, which is the Church of England or the Anglican Church, Joseph Judge Rutherford, which is the founder and who was the head of the Church of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, he's dead, by the way. Uh, Mary Baker Eddy, head of the Christian Science Church. That was in the 1800s, too. Uh, Ellen G. White, who was head of the Seventh-day Adventist churches. And um, that's 1800s. And Joseph Smith, head of the Mormon church. And that's in the 1830s when the Mormon church got started and he is the first prophet, quote unquote, of that church and he has a successor of men who hold that office and uh, the Mormon church has their head president which they call the prophet. They claim that he is a modern day prophet and under him they have what they call apostles. And so that is their organizational structure. So we see that these, these people, they, they organize into these, into these groups and to have control over those groups and to have uh, them follow them, you've got to have a written statement of rules, regulations, and what to believe, what not to believe. If you want to be a part of this group, you've got to follow these rules. And it's interesting that those in those denominations would look at us and call us legalist. I find that rather bizarre. Because we are, we are very stringent in our, in, our, uh, uh, in our goal of following the law of Christ only. No man-made creed or doctrine. Those who are in these denominations look at us and they say, well, you're a legalist if you do that, but look at all the laws, the bylaws, and all the things that a person has to follow within those denominations. But they think that that's freedom for some reason. Concerning denominational governing systems, the second paragraph on page 85, what is scriptural church government? <coughs> Excuse me. Who is the head of Christ's church? Does the Lord's church have a creed? The New Testament uh, of Jesus Christ answers our questions and tells all who are trying to be Christians what He expects of us. He tells us that He, Jesus Christ, is the head of the church. This is Ephesians 1, 17-22. That God, our Lord, Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ, put all things in subjection under His feet, gave Him to be head over all things to the church, which is His body. So he is the head of the church. One time when I was uh, in a Bible study with a man in Africa, he was very curious about churches of Christ, and he asked, where is your headquarters? 
And I said, the, the headquarters of the churches of Christ are nowhere found on earth. Because the head of the church is not on earth. It's in heaven. And that really surprised him. He never heard that before. Because all the denominations in the area where he lived, they had a headquarters on earth. And they had a, some man or group that run the denomination. They were over that denomination. And that was almost refreshing to him to, to hear that, that we don't have a, a, a man-made a headquarters and a man-made person running the church or a formulation of doctrine. Christ is the head of the church. And you're not going to improve upon His headship or His doctrine that's found in the Word of God. And therefore, uh, uh, we owe our allegiance to Him and to Him ultimately. In the original Greek, inspired by the Holy Spirit, three words are used for those assigned to be over each congregation. Each congregation in, in the New Testament was self-governing. They did not have a governing body that governed congregations within a given area, like a general assembly or, or a synod, or synod, I think it's called, that governed a group of congregations. Each congregation was independent of each other. And that's what churches of Christ are striving to do today. To be independent congregations. We don't answer to, as a congregation to anyone else. To any congregation or to any people. We answer to God and His Word. And so those three words that are used to describe these are presbyteros, elder, episkopos, bishop or overseer, and poimen, which is pastor or shepherd. The elders are the overseers, and they are also the pastors. Preachers aren't pastors. I'm not the pastor of this church. So many times people uh, look to me and see uh, uh, those on the outside will call and ask if I'm the pastor or call me Pastor Payton. And, and I said, no, I'm, I'm not a pastor. I'm the preacher. And in people's minds... Preacher and pastor means the same thing because that's what you find in the denominations. But again, we do not follow the denominational trends. I am a preacher. I'm an evangelist. A teacher. I am not a pastor. The elders of a church are the pastors of the church. They are the overseers. Those three words are used interchangeably to describe those who would be over the church and those who are shepherding the church. Page 85, a third paragraph. While dozens of passages in the New Testament refer to these terms, the one place where all three are found are Acts chapter 20, verses 17 through 28. So if you want to turn there in your Bible, we're looking at the scriptural organization of the church. And it's only organized on the congregational level. That's the only organization of the church on the congregational level. Acts chapter 20 and verse 17 says, From Miletus, Paul, he, sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. Notice, elders, plural, of the church, singular. One congregation had two or more elders in it. Then in verse 28, he uses these words. He says, therefore, he's talking to the elders. Take heed to yourself and to all the flock, that's the church, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. The Holy Spirit does that through the qualifications found in God's Word. Notice they're called overseers there. That's the word episkopos. To shepherd. That's the word for the pastor's work. To shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. So elders are overseers and shepherds. And that is the organization of God's uh, church, as you find it sim simply put, like in Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops, overseers, and deacons. 
Those are the elders. Elders and deacons. Now back to our book, page 85, it talks about these words. Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders, presbyteros, of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, Keep watch over yourself and all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Episcopos. Be shepherds, poimain, of the house of God, or the church of God which he purchased with his blood. So the elders, that denotes maturity in age and maturity spiritually, are the ones who oversee the congregation and they are the ones who shepherd the sheep as you follow that imagery all the way through. And they are simply making sure that God's will is being carried out within a congregation, making sure the congregation is faithful to the Lord and making sure that the congregation is being fed and cared for properly as you study the work of shepherds in the uh, Middle East. They did more than just feed the flock. They were out with their flocks. Remember when Jesus was born? The shepherds were out with their flocks at night. That's what shepherds did. They were with their sheep at night. They were with them to protect them and also to care for them and to feed them. And that is the work of the eldership within a congregation. Look at page 85. In this reference, we see that these are not three different offices or organizational levels, but are three descriptive designations for the same leader. An elder is an overseer, and an elder is a pastor. In some denominational churches, you'll have a board of elders, then you'll have a pastor. Board of elders and a pastor, and the sometimes I'll call them the senior pastor, is over everybody else. It's almost a pyramid structure. And that pyramid structure type of organization goes back to Roman Catholicism where you have the Pope at the top. And then under him, those who are archbishops. And then the bishops and then the priests. That pyramid type structure is denominational. It's not biblical. Christ is the only head of His church. And each congregation chooses from its own membership their own eldership. Yes. That's what actually where they got their name. The Presbyterian Church got its name from presbyteros, that Greek word for elders, because in their organization they have men who are said to be elders. And in the, uh, the Episcopal Church came from episkopos. Because they have men that they claim are bishops or overseers. The Archbishop of Canterbury uh, is the head of the Episcopal Church. So that's where those names came from, actually, those uh, Greek words. So the last paragraph on page 85, and these uh, we've already read that uh, sentence there. Consequently, an elder, presbyteros, is to be a bishop or an overseer, and he is to pastor or shepherd, poimain, the flock of God. And that, that is the work of the elders to do that. That's not the work of the preacher. He is not to be the shepherd. He is not to be the overseer. He has, the, the preacher has no authority. He's just a servant of the church. He has no more authority than a song leader. His, his work is to preach the Word of God. His authority comes from the Word of God. Paul tells Titus, you preach and convict with all authority. But that authority is the Word of God. He doesn't have decision-making authority. And that's why when a congregation does not have uh, an eldership in place, they have men's meetings in which decisions are made and the preacher's uh, opinion on something is no more important than any other man in the congregation. And a preacher, if he's doing what he should be doing, should not be trying to run a congregation. He is a servant of the congregation the same as deacons are, uh, in the sense of serving, and in the same as all the other members. The congregation submits to the authority of the eldership. 
Look at verse, uh, verse <laughs> page 86, second uh, paragraph. Nowhere in the New Testament of Christ does God assign the place of authority or responsibility to one single man. I might make this note as well. There's no such thing as a head elder in an eldership. No such thing. I know some churches of Christ that have, they won't say he's the head elder, but they have a head elder in the eldership, and that is unscriptural. All the elders are equal within an eldership. Always in God's plan, a church is to have a plurality of elders and pastors or bishops. Titus chapter 1 and verse 5. The qualifications and responsibilities of pastors, bishops, and elders are, this is from 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 7. If a man seeks the office of a bishop or overseer, he desires a good work. The bishop then must be without reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, orderly, given to hospitality, apt to teach, no brawler, no striker, but gentle, not contentious, no lover of money, one that rules well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. But if a man knows not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, that means a new Christian, lest being puffed up he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony from them that are without, lest he fall in reproach and the snare of the devil. 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7. So we see the qualifications there of the elder, and they're they're called uh, a bishop or an overseer uh, in that passage. Another reference states, and this is from uh, Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. So remember, 1 Timothy 3, Titus chapter 1, there's where the qualifications of the elders are. 1 Timothy 3, Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. For this cause I left you in Crete, talking to Titus, that you should set in order the things that are wanting and appoint elders in every city. As I gave the charge, if a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having children that believe, who are not accused of riot or unruly, for the bishop must be blameless as God's steward, not self-willed, not soon angry, not no brawler, no striker, not greedy for filthy lucre, that means Greedy for money, they're greedy. But given to hospitality, a lover of good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding to the faithful word which is according to the teaching, that he may be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and convict the gainsayer. And what that simply means there in verse 9, an elder has to be knowledgeable of God's word so that they can exhort with sound doctrine. they got to be able to teach and exhort the, the, the Christians and convict the gainsayer. And that means those who are contradicting sound doctrine. They have to protect the congregation from false teachers. Well, you can't, know, you can't do that if you don't know the Bible. And an elder, an eldership has to be knowledgeable of God's Word and has to be aware of the dangers that are out there so that they can both teach, they got to be able to teach, and when something comes up that contradicts sound doctrine, they've got to correct it. they got to speak uh, the truth in love, always. So we see here these are the men, and these men within a congregation are not policy-making men. The policy is already given. These are men who make sure God's will is being carried out. And that's why they are the shepherds of the church. He doesn't mention this passage in the book, and I want to look at it. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. Peter talks about elders and their work. Peter here describes himself as a fellow elder. You know, Peter never recognized or never thought of himself as a pope. It's very strange to me when you read First and Second Peter, Peter never thought he was a pope, yet the Catholics say he was the first pope. But he says here in First Peter chapter 5 and verse 1, he says, as he writes to the elders, he says, The elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder, not head elder, 
fellow elder. So here the apostle Peter was an elder. He's a fellow elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. What's the work of the elders? Verse 2, shepherd the flock of God which is among you. That's poimain. That's, that's the word for pastor. They are to pastor the church. Serving as overseers, episkopos. They oversee the congregation. Not by compulsion, but willingly. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. In other words, they're not forced to do it. They're willing to do it. They have to have a desire to be an elder. And not for dishonest gain. They're not doing it dishonestly. They're doing it eagerly. They want to serve the Lord. Verse 3. Nor as being lords over those who are entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. The word Lord there is referring to ones who would be masters. They are not ones that we are loyal to in the sense of we're following them. And elders who want to be elders because they want people to follow them want to be elders for the wrong reason. Men who want to be elders should want to be elders because they want to help people follow Christ. Not them. And so they're not to be lords over those entrusted, but being examples to the flock. They are examples or model Christians within the congregation. And notice what he says in verse 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Well, who's the chief shepherd? Christ. Peter said the chief shepherd is Christ. Not himself. Christ is the head of the church. Christ founded the church. Christ established the church. He is the king over the kingdom. He is the chief shepherd. Look at 1 Peter 2 and verse 25 as we're looking at Christ as the supreme leader of the church. 1 Peter 2 and verse 25, Peter says, For you were like sheep going astray, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. In the context there, he's talking about Christ. Peter recognized that Christ was the head and the only head, the only chief shepherd, the only great overseer of the church. Therefore, we do not bow the knee to the Pope. Page 87 Second paragraph, we're almost finished with this chapter. These two passages make it clear that no no man or woman, or no unwed man or woman, may be a pastor or a bishop in the Lord's church. Uh, the, The point there in the first sentence is no woman can be a pastor in the church, or a bishop, or an elder. The husband of one wife. Uh, That is very clear for those who want to see it. Also, no such titles as reverend or right reverend or most holy reverend exist in the church of Jesus Christ. In fact, the only one called reverend in the Bible is God Himself. Psalm 111 and verse 9. And that's only in the King James Version. The Old King James Version in Psalm 111 and verse 9 as it's talking about God says, Holy and reverend is your name. Talking about God. That's the only time the word reverend is found in the Bible, in the King James Version, and it refers to God. And yet you have people today who love to be called reverend. The Reverend Al Sharpton. The Reverend Jesse Jackson. They love to get on TV and for people to exalt them with the title of reverend. Sometimes you'll hear hear people refer to the Reverend Billy Graham. That's nothing short of blasphemy. Nothing short of it. I've questioned some of the denominational pastors here in town that call themselves reverend. Oh, they get so mad when you do that. They don't like to be questioned. You're just supposed to go along with them. But I ask them, uh, you know, why would you call yourself that? Paul never referred to himself. You read, he wrote most of the New Testament. He never referred to himself as Reverend Paul. I guarantee you he's a greater Christian than any of the people that are claiming to be Christians here in Roy City. Yet he never called himself Reverend Paul. 
He never referred to Timothy or Titus as Reverend Timothy or Reverend Titus. And they were preachers. Where does that come from? Catholicism. Catholicism. Catholicism calls their head the Papa, the Pope. He is called the Holy Father. Again, only God is called Holy Father in the Bible. They call their priests within Catholicism reverend. That's all residue of Catholicism that's found in every human denomination. These exalted titles. You know, in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus denounced the use of religious titles. He said, don't call anyone on earth your father. He's not referring to your biological father. He's talking about spiritually. You don't exalt people with these titles. He says, you don't do that. You're all brethren. And if uh, you come across an, an elder in the church and an elder that's faithfully serving the Lord, uh, you call them a brother or you call them by their name. They shouldn't be expecting you to uh, call them by some sort of exalted title. I had a phone call a few about two weeks ago from a lady that's going to move into this area and she was interested in the church here. She's living down in Houston. And um, in the course of the conversation, she asked, what, can I, what do I call you? I said, well, you just call me Sean. She said, well, I didn't know if you had a religious title or, or anything. I said, no, 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 no religious titles. You just call me Sean. We are too busy in the religious world, and I say we accom- accommodatively, we're too busy exalting one another patting one another on the back. And that glory and that exaltation should only belong to God and His Son, Jesus Christ. It's sickening to see how people want to exalt each other and their religious leaders. As we look at page 87, the last paragraph, God's plan is that each congregation, each church is autonomous. That means self-governing and is led by and overseen by men selected from that congregation. As a result, no headquarters with controlling power and authority to assign a creed is in existence by which all the congregations under their association must follow. Our only creed is the New Testament, and our only headquarters is in heaven, where the only head of the Christ church, the Lord Jesus Christ, Himself reigns until the day when He returns to deliver His church, His bride, to our Father in heaven. So we have no headquarters. We have absolutely no earthly creeds. Now in studying with people, I've heard people say this in some of the online Bible studies that I've had. I said, you, you people in churches of Christ, you have a creed. It's a creed that you've had since the 1800s. The creed is this. Uh, we're Christians only, but not the only Christians. Or, you'll call Bible things and Bible things and do Bible things in Bible ways. Where the Bible is silent, you'll be silent. Where the Bible speaks, that's where you'll speak. That's your creed. That's not a creed. That's a motto. But that's what we've been accused of. That's your creed. Where the Bible speaks, we speak. Where the Bible's silent, we're silent. That's what the brethren used to say in the 1800s, and and we still say today. That's not a creed. That's a motto. There's a difference in a motto and a creed. It's saying where the Bible teaches it, and where it is authorized, that's where we'll preach it, and that's where we'll practice it. If the Bible is silent on it, then we will not preach it. We will not practice it. That's why we don't have infant baptism here. The Bible doesn't authorize it. That's why we don't have musical instruments here. The Bible doesn't authorize it. So you cannot, uh, they cannot assign to us uh, that as being a creed. It's not a creed. It's a motto. If I say Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, I didn't give you a creed. I gave you a statement from the Bible. Just because I said it doesn't make it into a man-made creed. Yes, Exactly. Exactly. 
That, that's a very good point because you've heard the statement, you need help misunderstanding it. Well, creeds will help you misunderstand uh, what, what, uh, what the Bible teaches. And that goes all the way back to the concept, again, of Catholicism, in which within Catholicism, the magisterium or the clergy interprets the Bible for the people. They say you cannot study the Bible for yourself. You've got to have the bishops to tell you what the Bible says. And therefore, that concept is even found in, in denominations. That if you've got to listen to the pastor, they say. He's anointed of God. And therefore, you've got to listen to what he says the Bible says or his interpretation of that verse. And that's that concept that goes back to Catholicism in which uh, they interpret the Bible for their people. And so... Um, there's, there, they will say on one hand, they believe the Bible is the Word of God, but what does my priest say about it? What does my pastor say about it? Instead of saying, what does the Bible say? And uh, that being the absolute and total conclusion of all the matter. That's one of the things in the, early, the late 1700s and early 1800s, as people in this nation were going back to the Bible in the Restoration Movement, they said, we need to get rid of these creeds. We need to get rid of these catechisms. We need to get rid of these things and just take the Bible and it alone as our true faith and practice. We don't need the Bible and the Nicene Creed. We don't need the Bible and the Augsburg Confession. We don't need the Bible and this or that or that. No, we just need the Bible alone. And that's what we preach in Churches of Christ. And that's what faithful Churches of Christ have preached uh, throughout the years. Page 89, in the conclusion of this book, the author says again, May I say the purpose of this book is that we search God's Word and get a clear understanding of the Lord's Church as pictured in His New Testament. My intention has been neither to judge or condemn our friends, neighbors, or relatives, but to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. My prayer will continue to be that we will all follow His way and not our own. And thus concludes the study of this, this book. I hope you've enjoyed it. I've really enjoyed this book. It's good to get back to the basics. Uh, next week, Lord willing, we're going to begin a study on the subject of the Holy Spirit. And that will take up uh, several Sundays. And so we will start that study uh, next week. Thank you very much for your time.